welcome to Always Take Notes. In this week's episode, Simon spoke to Dan Franklin, who is the associate editor of Jonathan Cape. So Dan is a legendary figure in British publishing. Uh, He used to run Jonathan Cape, uh, and he now still works there three days a week. He edits some of the most famous uh, British literary novelists, including Ian McEwan uh, and Julian Barnes. And he spoke really fascinatingly about his own long career and also about what it means to be uh, an editor, both of fiction and of nonfiction. We hope you enjoy the episode. Okay, I'm here with Dan Franklin at the uh, headquarters of Penguin Random House in, in central London. Dan, can we start off with you just telling me a bit about your, your early career and your entry into publishing in the 1970s and how, how the business then compared to how it is now? Um, I, started, I started with Peter Owen, who was a tiny independent publisher. So it was completely atypical and remained so. I mean, it, the, the company is still going, which is completely astonishing. Um, but it was very, very atypical at the time. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I don't think one can extrapolate from that to the general um, state of publishing as a whole. But there are certain things that you can certainly talk about. I started in 1970 and I was called the sales assistant I think the staff was about four people and I worked in the office in the morning where I had to mark up the invoices as they came in by post you know which is incredible now Um, and I wrote down on each one what the discount was so I wrote one third etc etc that was then passed on to the warehouse and the warehouse was positively the whole thing was Dickensian the warehouse was in off the Gloucester Road and um, still had copies of all the books that Peter had published 20 years beforehand sitting there in mouldering stacks but in the afternoon I went out and I was the sales rep in London for the imprint. And that's where, I mean, that's where it's completely different. Because there were only, I only had to make about six calls ever. Because there weren't any bookshops. Okay. I mean, there was Hatchards and there was Foils. And there were about four others. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but it was, it was almost like that. So the whole world was utterly different from the, from a book selling point of view. And where had you come from? Had you done a humanities degree? or what was I'd done your... English and American literature at UEA. Okay. And I published, a, I published a poetry magazine while there. And that was... It was different then. It was, you, didn't, you didn't have to... You didn't have to get a job. It was sort of... Lots of people went travelling or whatever. Um, And I wanted a job, but the only thing that I could think that I could do... And I sort of thought to myself, I would, you know, I would would read the papers and I would think, God, you ought to get so-and-so to write a book. And then six months later... Tom Mashler, who then ran Cape, who was the best publisher at the time, then published exactly that book and sometimes made a success of it. And so I thought maybe I could do this. And at that time, all these, what we would now refer to as imprints, were separate firms? Yeah. Were they? Okay. Yeah. And uh, the actual sort of volume of books being published, was that much smaller? No, I don't think so. I I don't know. I honestly don't know. But I, but I don't think so. I don't think that much smaller. Sure. And what, what were the relative advantages and disadvantages of the, the landscape as it was constituted then compared to how things are now? Again, it's very difficult for me to say because I was in a completely atypical company. Yeah. Peter Owen was publishing mainly translated fiction okay. and sort of odd, eccentric, non-fiction, lots of kind of counter kind of books which appealed to me very much 
I mean, I, you know, I was, I was probably still a hippie in 1970, mm. and so he had lots of dope books, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but he was a very, very defensive publisher, in that he he, he, he printed very, very small print runs okay. and priced at least one or two pounds higher than almost everybody else in the market. Okay. Um, which in the end drove me up the wall, you know, because if he had something that was wonderful and, yeah. was, you know, you could really do something with it, one thought, he wouldn't reprint it and so on and so forth. And were there agents at that stage in the, in the way that they Yes, were but again... Absolutely, there were agents, but he never dealt with them okay. because he paid peanuts. So I had no, absolutely no experience of agents at all until I left. And so, what was your movement on from Peter Owen onwards? Well, the, uh, within Peter Owen, I went from the sales assistant job to becoming sort of junior editor, and then I became the the, the single editor there. So I was responsible for everything. Um, and I stayed there for far too long. It was a serious career error. As why so? Why? I felt kind of responsible, I think. But why was it an error? Because I, I, I was way behind my co-evils, as it were. Oh, okay. um, you know, if you look at if, if you have a career path, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But from there, I went to... Harville Press, as it was then constituted, okay. which is part of Collins, and it published translations again, so I was well qualified for that. Yeah. And Fiction, mostly. Yeah. And really seriously weird non-fiction. Could you give an example? Um, well, it was run, the big, the big boss was a wonderful man called Adrian House who loved publishing books about sort of African animals. Okay. If a book came in which had a leopard with its tail hanging down off a branch of a tree, Bob's your uncle, he would right. buy it, you know. Okay. And and then what was your movement after that? After that I was headhunted to go to Heinemann. Which was independent at the time. Which was independent just... Was it independent? Yes, it was, it was. Um, but as soon as I got there... I mean, I was... I was... I, I was head... I, well, I, actually, we've left out a stage. We've, we, we must go back a bit. Okay. Harville belonged to Collins, so it was within the Collins office. And Collins, which was then run... And this is re was really interesting. I mean, it was then run. It was the end of a sort of golden age. It was run by gentlemen. Okay. So the editorial directors were Mark Bonham Carter, Philip Ziegler, Richard Ollard. And if they, you know, they go out to lunch every day in the reform club okay. quite often with the home secretary or the foreign you know they yeah. walked with kings these people um, but it was run by hard headed Scotsman it was run by Ian Chapman senior father of the current Ian Chapman who runs, runs Simon and Schuster and he and his wife were sort of the power in the land and they used to have they had a sort of, every July there was usually a revolution okay. and kind of people were just murdered, as it were. Authors or staff? Staff. Okay. Really senior, crucial people. <laughs> okay. And everybody moved around and you'd go, you'd walk across the road to the Arts Club in Albemarle Street and you'd look, there was a new family tree and you'd see who'd gone and you'd okay. see where you ended up. So, I moved from Harville to Collins General, okay. 
And Christopher McElhose, who was running Collins General, moved and took over Harville. So what year are we talking about? Yeah. No idea, but I would say something like 80, 81, 82. Okay. And that was, to me, appalling. I mean, really... Uh, Collins General were... They were Alistair MacLean, they were Hammond Innes. Yeah. You know, they were the most commercial... They were mammon personified. Right. Whereas I was holier than thou and had just been editing Life and Fate, you know. Yeah. So it was it was it was horrifying. But actually I very much enjoyed it. There were some wonderful people. You'd actually there. been editing Life and Fate at that stage. Yeah. yeah. Was that the first English? That's a big thing I did at Harville. Okay. It took me Could you talk a little bit about that? This is Vasily Grossman's yeah. World War Two novel. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was very it was very it was very it was just, it was very memorable. I mean, I don't think I made any contribution at all, but it was translated by Robert Chandler, you know, who's okay. the great translator from the Russian. And I think it was his first big translation. And he had just lost both his legs okay. in a bicycling accident at Highbury Corner. Okay. So he was completely crippled. So I had to go to him somewhere in. Finsbury Park or somewhere and we sat there all day okay. um, and I made the mistake he got, offered me a cup of tea the first day I was there and I never had one again because he was macrobiotic it was, it was absolutely the most disgusting thing I've ever eaten but we okay. sat there and we produced this and how had the text come out of Russia at that stage had it, was it, it had been smuggled out Sam is dead. Yeah. Yeah. But, and so just returning you, you were then moved into this extremely commercial yeah, world in the early eighties. Yeah, and I, I somewhat, my particular thing I did. I mean, my particular my sort of major author there was Eric Newby. Okay, who wrote a short walk in Hindu Kush. Yeah, who I adored, and he and he was at the end of his career, mm. and. It was just a, it was just a, a, a joy working with him, and okay. he became a, he became a good friend. Um, and then I was the actual the, the editorial director of Collins. Then was Simon King, who was a wonderful, wonderful man. Died last year, and he he said, you know, that's when I started commissioning. He said, okay. have you got any ideas? And so I started buying books in a very, very rudimentary form. Initially doing, antho I did a series of anthologies, which is a very good way of getting to know agents and you yeah. could get to know authors. Um, and then um, and then I was headhunted, but it was beginning to, the, towards the end of the, my time at Collins, it was beginning to go really horrible. And then you went to Cape? No, then I went to Heinemann. Okay. I was then headhunted for Heinemann. Okay. And, and before moving on with the chronology, could we talk a bit about what being a, a book editor, in your view, involves? What is the heart of the job? Um, well, you're, I mean, you're, you are... You're making, the, you're making the book as good as you can get it. Um... But only, I mean, I firmly believe that the author knows best um, unless they, I mean, occasionally one throws one's hand up and says, no, OK, we could, this isn't going to work. But otherwise, you know, there's a difference between American editors and English editors. You know, they think we don't edit because we don't force people to change every sentence as mm. they do in the States. But mainly now in a company like this, it is that you're actually, you are the prime representative for that author and that book. Internally. Internally, with, it, with, all, the, with all the various departments. Okay. As well as working on the text. And can we, can we then go back to, um, so from, from Heinemann in the 80s, what are, your, what are you doing when you're in that role? Well... This is when we're, we now we're really getting into corporate 
This is where the money starts coming okay. in. Because Heinemann is still independent? Yeah, thing. but as soon as I got there, almost immediately, there was a day when every single director of the company resigned. Okay. And I had no idea why. I'm still still not entirely sure to this day, although some of them are friends of mine. But it was when they were taken over by Octopus. Okay. And I was the last person left. I was the kind of the boy on the burning deck. So I had to go to the Frankfurt Book Fair. And o- Octopus was a publishing firm? or a yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of big Paul Hamlin conglomerate. Right. Made made millions. Paul Hamlin. Paul Hamlin was a genius. Made millions selling cheap illustrated books, all printed in Czechoslovakia at the end of the war when there was no Czechoslovakia had no industry, and he. Uh, but they, you know, they had this ability to print illustrated books, and he gave them loads and loads of work. And I once went there on a on a sort of mission for, with people from Octopus, and he is at Paul Paul Hamlin was regarded as a saint there. The people had his picture on the wall. Okay. Know. So anyway, they but again they were they were sort of ruthlessly commercial, yeah. um, and they acquired Heinemann and Secker, which were joined together then. Um, and everybody, everybody resigned. Except for you. Except for me, because I was too kind of you know I was too naive. I didn't know what the uh, what we, the, what the issues the, were in the mid eighties. Yeah. And I remember how you know I, my boss was Fanny Blake, um, and I had to go to the Frankfurt Book Fair for the first time okay. with her a list of appointments. And explain to everybody, I'm terribly sorry, she's left, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, in came Helen Fraser, okay. with whom I'd worked at Collins, and she'd been Collins. Meanwhile, Eddie Bell had had done his mischief. He'd fired Simon King. Helen Fraser had stood up for Simon King, and so she got fired. She had to she she had to do six months gardening leave, okay. and then she got the job at Heinemann, okay. and then life became briefly really good fun. And who were you publishing at that time? Well, famously, I mean this is this is what this is one of my famously tiresome anecdotes, which I'll give you. Do tell. Well, famously, I was I was. I was in the, I was in the office on Christmas Eve. Right. No one else in London was working on Christmas Eve. And I was rung up by Marianne Valmans, who now runs Doubleday at Transworld, who was then representing Doubleday in London. They Doubleday always had somebody in London who sold their books for them. The American, the main, you know, the American company. And she rang up and she had this book called Moonwalk by Michael Jackson. And he was then huge king of the world. Yeah. And they were publishing, Double J US were publishing it in February. Mm-hmm. The editor in America was Jackie Kennedy. Yeah. And... I don't think I even read it actually. I just said okay, and I offered her a sum of money, and she had to accept it because she had to sell it before Christmas. Okay. Due to the English proclivity for taking long Christmas holidays. Okay. If she'd waited till everyone came back on January the third or whatever, it would have been too late. So it, I bought this, and. Um, it was terrible. I mean, it was really. And I, I looked it up. It, it would it had been like rewritten completely in draft and things like they'd fired one writer and yeah, stuff like that. And it was, but it was sort of you know I love children, I love trees, you know. So. Okay. But. But he was king of the world. I think it was, 
I think it was number one for something like 52 weeks. You know. Okay. But it was so amazing. It just went on and on and on. And you also published Sex by Madonna. Yeah, that was at Seca. Okay, how did that come about? That I was made to do. Okay. I mean, the, the, my then boss loved that kind of thing, so he sort of came back from America and said, do, the, you know, do this book on your list. Okay. And no, I never met her. And we never... It sold out within 24 hours. Okay. And it never reprinted. Okay. And we had a ludicrous launch party in that... Borders, or whatever it was. It, oh, I think it was called Borders. But anyway, in, in, in Charing Cross Road with a Madonna impersonator. <laughs> it was just... The whole thing was so... Who was, who was branded as the impersonator? Were you passing, yeah. passing her off as... No, they branded. It was okay. really, really sort of cheap and... Could we could we move from from those very commercial things to talking about some of the really literary writers who right. work with Sir McEwen and people like that? When did these relationships begin? Well, they began when I got here, but but primarily when I was at Heinemann, yeah. crucially, that the, there was one month when I got on the slush pile. And there was such a thing in those days. I got the first chapter of The Lost Continent by Bill Bryson, yeah. which I would argue is the best thing he's ever written. Um, so I commissioned that. And he was what, an unknown sub editor? He was a sub editor on The Independent. Yeah. Um, and hadn't published anything? Like no. That. I think he may have published, he did a dictionary. Okay. A sort of writer's and editor's dictionary. I think he may have done that before before The Lost Continent. Yeah. And then the same month, The Commitments, Roddy Doyle. Right. And that was... I mean, which, that was, which year is this? God, I can't remember, but 87, something like that. Okay. Um... Yeah, so it did, I think it probably was 87, 88. Okay. And, um, and that was a sort of key moment. I mean, that was the first fiction that I published because I was supposed to be doing non-fiction. Yeah. But I, you know, I loved that book and I loved the... I loved that music, so it was, so it was absolutely... And, and were these coming in unagented? They were literally yeah. on the slush pile? Yeah, yeah. And so was there anything else in this magic month that you... No, okay. it's enough for one month. I mean, that's yeah. your... That's actually your lifetime supply. Yeah. If you're getting through from the slush pile, you never get more than yeah. two in a lifetime. OK. You know, that, so it was... And what did you see in them? Well, Bryson was a ge- genius. I mean, Bryson, you literally... You know, you wet yourself reading this... I mean, it was ten pages. Yeah. And it was, you know, people who can write funny. And that was really, it was really, really funny. And wh- I haven't read that, I've read a lot of other Bryson, but what is The Lost Continent about? The Lost Continent is, it's, it's, it's about his childhood. It's him going back, it's him going back to America okay. and rechasing. It starts, something like, I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa, somebody had to, and yeah. then it's all about the hor- horrors of growing up in Des Moines yeah. and travelling round and going to the places where he would go with his with his father in the back of the car etc okay. etc and he he what he was what he was wanting was to be commissioned to go to America to, to do this road trip right and I think I paid him in Prince 1500 pounds and 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 he went off and did it. Okay. Um, then, when the boat was finished, our rights director, it was then Felicity Rubenstein, auctioned it in America and sold it for $350,000 or in something. In the late 80s? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so a little bit of money. Yeah. yeah. And changed his life, yeah. changed my life, etc., etc. How did it change your life? Well, just because suddenly, you know, I you had this big. I made the company lots of money. And did that change your kind of currency internally? internally? Yeah, I mean, it, 
it's a, it, you know people if you, if you have a success then people are more inclined to believe you when you tell them about the next thing that you yeah. think is going to work and what was the next thing can't remember okay and then so going back to McEwen and people that that becomes a cape yeah. does it and when do you move to cape well the key thing okay so after three years or something at Heinemann I'm then I'm then appointed to run SECA okay which is the really serious job doing really serious literary books okay fiction yeah, yeah. and non-fiction okay. it's a wonderful list and I was I sitting in there is Robin Robertson and he was already working there so we've worked together for 30 years and he was doing he was doing amazing publishing when I got there and went on to do you know to do even more to do to, 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 to do kind of Irving Welsh and so on and so forth and but I could then I then had my own list in which I could experiment okay and who were your writers at that stage um well, the key... I mean, I was... You know, I was... Roddy obviously became crucially important yeah. because then, you know, there's the film of... film of the... film of the commitments, the snapper, and then the van, shortlisted for the Booker Prize. Paddy Clark then won the Booker. Yeah. Um, and I was editing... And I was editing... I was editing... Of the people who were still there, I was editing Malcolm Bradbury and David Lodge. Mm. I mean, Malcolm Bradbury taught me at UEA, so that was a great pleasure. Yeah. But then I was taking on people like Louis de Bernier, um, and who was an unknown? Who was a total unknown? How yeah. did you find him? He had an agent who was just okay. sent in. Okay. And how does your relationship with a writer change from being a complete unknown to them being a a Booker Prize winner or something like that. How do you how do you manage those relationships? Well, I mean, I'm trying to think of one of the writers of mine who've won the Booker. I mean, it's not there's never been a problem in that. I mean, the only sort of as it were. I mean, otherwise, you know, it's Barnes and McEwen who were who were well well established long before. I got here yeah. um, and should have won the book a long before um, but with Roddy um, Roddy's the most grounded author in the universe I mean he ought to, I always say he ought to give classes for young writers about how you behave because okay. from the word go he, he knew exactly what he was doing could you give some examples his first interview was in the Groucho Club, with some journalist, yeah. and that was his first interview for his novel, which most people, you know, would be nervous. And, yeah. and he came out and he said, um, "If if you ever make me go in a place like that ever again, I'm leaving." Okay. You know, and he just knew. Yeah. And when you're when you're editing fiction, what? What are you doing? What are the discussions? What are you? I'm not on? doing anything. I'm a really, really bad fiction editor. Okay. Um, I have no. I find that hard to believe. No, it's true. All I can do is recognise almost everything that I've taken on has been really good when I've taken it on. Okay. I'm, you know. That I, I have the greatest admiration for people who say change third person to first person, etc., etc. Yeah. And I've worked with lots of wonderful editors, but I'm not one of them. Okay. I've employed them, you know, and Robin is really good at that, and there are people out there who are brilliant at it. But I, I, I quite truthfully, it's not my skill. So what is your skill? I, I think I'm much better at non-fiction. But I mean, if I have one, it is that, you know, that. Because the whole thing is gambling, right? Yeah. What we do. So, you know, my skill is thinking it's worth putting all my chips on that particular. Okay. And how is it different in non-fiction? 
um, hard to describe, but the structure is different. You know, you're not you're not taking apart something that is you know, sort of absolutely crucial in the way that is in is in fiction. Yeah. And it's easier to wrestle with an author's work and I think they will accept it more than if the novelists were. And how when did you come to Cape then? I came to Cape in ninety three. Okay. And what was Cape's kind of position then in the the British literary market? It it had it had changed. I mean Tom Mashler when Tom Mashler ran it, it what you know, which is when I was, you know, I used to go when I was a teenager. I used to go to the library and I would take out every single Cape novel just by looking at the colophon. Really? Okay. Yeah, because I mean they were amazing. They were simply amazing. Could you give some examples? Who were they publishing at that? Well, they were, you know, they were publishing Catch Twenty Two, Thomas Pynchon. You know, McEwen, Barnes, Rushdie, you know, it was, it was Tom and, and, and Liz Calder. Yeah. Amazing American list. And um, they were independent at that time. Yeah. yeah. Then they're taken over by Random House. Before you arrived. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and David Godwin had been running it, and I, I, I'd succeeded David Godwin at SECA as well. Okay. So we have this kind of odd sort of symbiotic relationship. And I had at least twice, if not three times, tr- it was obviously the place that I wanted to work. Yeah. It had, to, to me, Cape had the best list. Cape was the best publisher. Um, and I applied, as I say, several times to, to Tom and, and never got the job. Yeah. So I arrived, and then I was his boss. Okay. <laughs> and so when, when when you arrive in ninety three, it's part of Random House. But and who were the? How does how does that uh, Cape of ninety three compare to the Cape as a teenager? You were taking every book out of there. Well, it's a change because David had been had been running it, you know, in, in the interregnum. Yeah. There was still, there was still the, you know, the Barnes, Rushdie, Amos. McEwen axis there, yeah. but but he had taken on David had taken on many many other writers of his taste, okay. and he 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 had a wonderful wonderful designer in Pete Dyer, famous jacket designer, who who had actually been at Seca with us at one point, and um, and he had Mark Hoban who is the most brilliant photographic publisher in this country. Okay. So he was doing, you know, Maplethorpe and Avedon and so on and so forth. Yeah. And um, and some wonderful books, but not the it wasn't quite it wasn't quite the kind of glorious thing that it was ten years earlier. Yeah. In my view. And that McEwen Amos Rushdie axis, how how much of an axis is it, both in within publishing but within the broader literary landscape? And are, are they all the kind of gang who hang out together in reality? They're all friends. Yeah. I think they hang out very little yeah. in that they're at different ends of the world, as it were. Yeah. Um, but they're still. I mean, they are. You know, it, it, they are still completely ludicrously the last. The the. They're the they are the last kind of literary gang that everybody. Lumps together, yeah. and it's extraordinary. You know, there's. I mean, the, all the subsequent people. They don't have gangs, as it when, were. When were they first? Well, because of the first again. Bill Buford grant list, right, I from, think. Right, from 83. Yeah. Yeah. And because they were all on that. 
and they were, you know, and they were, they were friends, and you know, and then so I, I arrived, you know, almost as soon as I arrived, I had the awful Martin Amis when in, he information when he moved agent. Yeah, yeah. And how did that affect you as the? Publisher? Well, it was it was just awful, you know that that. This, to give context, as you don't know, is when he, correct me if I'm wrong, he fired his long-time agent. His long-time agent being Pat Kavanagh, yeah. who was Julian Barnes's wife. Yeah. And then he, you know, famously, you know, the, the legend has it that, you know, he was having his teeth fixed in New York and he needed lots of money. Yeah. And, and, and so he moved to Andrew Wiley. Yeah. That was the moment when everybody was moving to Andrew Wiley. Okay. He he was literally cleaning up um, that roughly at that period. Sorry. Um, Why was that? What could he offer? Money? Mm. Yeah. But I think more to the point, he could. He could, you know, he he could recite the first ten pages of Finnegan's Wake. Okay, what was it, what's he like to deal with compared to a sort of old school London agent? Total, uh, total shock. Yeah, I mean, really, really terrifying. How so? Um, I mean, he's not like that now, but in those days, he was totally iconoclastic. He didn't, he didn't give a toss about. You know, old-fashioned relationships, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. You know, he would he would break um, break contracts, b- b- break option clauses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But he was completely brilliant because he had he only took on people who were really, really, really extraordinarily good. He didn't have any. Most people, publishers and agents, yeah. have people who aren't very good, who make lots of money. Yeah. He didn't have any of them. And we always try and talk with everyone every context about money on the podcast. How has the, the amounts of money being paid for both for the kind of fiction and the kind of non-fiction you publish changed over your career? Well, at, at, at this particular moment, well, actually, it's when when I was at Saka that it really started. Um, that then became competition. Um, when Peter Strauss was running Picador, he was very aggressively trying to trying to sort of build the list, and and he would. We, we saw him as a major threat. I he was offering lots and lots of money. Yeah. Um, and that was when, you know, some of these famous advances started getting paid. Like Amos being paid half a million. Yeah, but it was Carmen Khalil buying Michael Holroyd's Bernard Shaw. Okay. A biography. Yeah. yeah. Which was really, which I think was 625 grand, something like that. And when was that? And that was, a, you'll have to check, but whenever yeah. it, you know, just before it came out. And it was, that was really astonishing. Okay. You know, because normally in those days, probably, you know, if you were a biographer, you'd be lucky if you got thirty grand or something. Okay. You know, and suddenly it became the whole thing became an industry. Yeah. And what about more broadly? How it's money, changed now. I mean, it's it's gone the other way. Yeah. Yeah. When did that happen? Post two thousand and eight crash, every, everything changed. Okay. In that. I mean, there used to be a time when, you know, if you want to buy a book, you do you do what's called you know a P and L, and you you do all your numbers. Yeah. With based on projected sales. Yeah. yeah. And in the old days, you know, you you put in people just put in completely ludicrous figures. Really. And everybody, you know, this this still happens occasionally. You know, the big. There are always three or four. They're always first novels. Yeah. 
because they don't have any track record, so that they, you know they've got no criminal record. They, they haven't got any book track figures, so the editor can say this is going to sell, you know. And four of them work, right? But they but they always go for lots of money these days. I mean, another point I was interested in. I read recently the the comments made by Philip Pullman and Anthony Beaver and the Society of Authors about authors' earnings and advances. And it, there was the Society of Authors said that um, publishers' actual spend on acquisition of books is about three percent of their turnover. Is that is that correct? It seems very low. I don't know whether that's correct. Okay, because it seems that um, you know the the point that they were making is that the, the book trade has been in recent years relatively buoyant, but authors' earnings have stagnated or fallen. Yeah. Why is that happening? Um. Amazon. Okay. I mean, there's this crucial thing, and, and again, around it, when Amazon starts, whenever that was, mm. you know, 1990 or something. That yeah. Publishers, publishers put in what's known as a high discount clause okay. in their contracts with Amazon. No, in the, generally, okay. they said it, you know, for sales. Sales at at a discount of over a certain percentage, yeah. you, we will only pay four fifths of the prevailing royalty or whatever. Okay. Amazon arrive when well, once Amazon are up and running, they the sales are, the sales are enormous. Okay. So you have something like. Captain Corelli, when it came out in paperback, yeah. would sell, you know, however many, 500,000 copies. Okay. So Louis sitting at home going chickety chick, 10, you know, 10% of 8.99 times, you know, I was yeah. getting this. And in fact, suddenly, he's getting nothing like that. And why? Because, uh, because of the, it's all this high discount. So he's getting a much smaller royalty. But it seems that even if the publishers themselves are making more money, then I can understand the role that Amazon has, but how can the publishers be making more money but the author's taking be going lower? Surely that's about decisions made within the publisher, not externally by the marketplace. I mean, it depends on... I, I, don't, think, I, don't, I, don't, think, I don't think the publishers are making... I don't. I don't think that percentage has changed okay. in my lifetime. Okay. In some cases, it probably definitely has. I mean, if you had a big bestseller, yeah. you know, and you're reprinting it over and over again, that's very, very profitable. Yeah. Has Has there become an increasing desire to get a few best-selling books as opposed to a larger spread? Of yeah, them? that's yeah. what the corporation wants. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I hate it. Yeah, you know. I mean, I mean, you know. They don't. Nobody's. Nobody's ever said that to me. But it's a. It's a sort of unwritten. You know what they want is for you to publish. You know the word they use is focus. What does that mean in that context? Don't publish. Don't publish ninety percent of this rubbish. But as you said earlier, just, it, it's, just, a, it's a gamble. Though, right? Yeah, you never know exactly what's going to be the big. When I when I started, it, it, you were regarded as a genius if one out of every five books you published was, I don't know whether it was bestseller or so, was successful. Yeah. And there are, I think, there are probably places now where you wouldn't be allowed that luxury. Okay. You'd be expected to have a sort of better hit rate than that. I don't see how you can. Yeah. Because. I believe I've you know I've I've always because I don't you know I don't publish crap I've always believed that that the books were wonderful yeah and you have to throw them at the wall and some of them stay what what has most surprised you for for, for sticking for being a hit and perhaps also the other way around what have, have there been something you thought was going to be a smash and then there were zillions of them yeah but yeah. I, I, you know too many to name but. I don't no. I don't. I, I don't think. I, I don't think I can answer that. Actually, I, I, what about the first part thing? A surprise hit. 
No, as I say, I always think they're going to work. Okay. And can we talk about some of your, your more recent writers? So, so Matt Haig, how did he come across your... Again, just from an agent. Yeah. And that was... It was a novel. Yeah, it? and I like... I, I like... I like... Um, I, mean, I don't do them anymore, but I like very English books. And it was very, very English. And I like... I like sort of weird, odd. So it was narrated by a Labrador. Okay. So you looked at a family through the eyes of... It's called The Last Family in England. Yeah. And you looked at this family through the eyes of the Labrador. And the okay. The family was falling apart. And it was brilliantly done. Yeah. And did very well, but then... Then his subsequent books on... And then I did, so I think, two more, which didn't work. Okay. And then he moved to Canongate, and the rest is history, you know, yeah. which is wonderful. Do, uh, how, if a writer, if you sign someone up and they produce a book and it's not, doesn't do that well, do, will they still get a second shot, or is that changing? Again, that's becoming more difficult. Yeah. But, but here, certainly within this division, yeah. they would get a second shot. They might have more trouble getting a third shot, yeah. but they definitely have trouble getting a fourth. Whereas, famously, I think Graham Greene worked with book ten. Okay. So you know you measure is what book three. Yeah, or, or whatever. Like you know, you measure people by you measure publishers by how loyal they remain. Yeah. And I mean, the key case for me is Tessa Hadley. Okay. You know, that's book seven or eight. Okay. Um, which we're publishing late late in the day, which we're publishing next month, yeah. and it just it just looks as though finally her moment has come. And is there now much more investment in covers, in design, and that sort of in kind of book yeah. as artifact? Yeah, and is that that's a, an ebook response? Isn't yeah, it? yeah, definitely. And how is that? How, are you involved in that kind of thing, or? No, not so. <coughs> I mean, I certainly, I, you know, I publish them. Yeah. And we have a brilliant design director who is very, very good at doing them. But I don't personally, I don't, sort of, you know, I don't. I mean, the things that, where I, you know, where I kind of, get my kicks that way yeah. is, is publishing graphic novels well, t- can you tell me a bit about your, where your interest in that came from well I started in 1998 um, when Random House Children's Books they published Raymond Briggs yeah. paperback and they said look I, we've got this new Raymond Briggs this is not the post nuclear war no war. this is Ethel and Ernest okay. a book about his parents and they said we don't think this is a, a children's book which indeed it isn't and would would you be interested mm. so I said yeah, absolutely because you know my children were then young I was spending my Life reading than Raymond Briggs and 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 it, you know as soon as I saw it I just saw the pencil version of it I thought this is a work of genius mm-hmm. and that then started this this list was the first one and I think you know at that point I thought it would probably be a one off did you face skepticism at no because he was such a not so much from Briggs but from the broader idea of the no movie. he was. A, I mean, there was a tradition at Cape. Tom Mashler published some wonderfully imaginative books. Yeah. I mean, he and he, you know, he's a, he was he was a brilliant children's publisher, and you know, and did kind of Roald Dahl and all that, that Clinton Blake and so on and so forth. But he also did things like, you're probably too young, but there was a book called Masquerade. Do you know about that? No. Kit Williams, 
it was a sort of bit large format illustrated book and you looked at the pictures and in it in each picture were hidden clues to how you, you and if you solved all the clues you go off to Wiltshire or somewhere and dig in a certain field and you'd find the golden hair okay. and the whole country became totally obsessed by this was there a golden hair? yeah there was yeah. and somebody found it and he did Jonathan Miller's book on the human body again as big as an illustrated thing and so on and so forth so there was a tr- tradition of Cape doing sort of interested quasi illustrative books yeah. And as, as a final thing, you mentioned you also worked with Philip Roth and Tom Wolfe. Were you, were you editing them? No. Or were you just publishing them? In I never met Philip Roth. I was just publishing them. Okay. And would you have any interaction with the text or anything like no. that? Yeah. Absolutely not. Okay. I mean, I, mean I, I, I learned very early on with him yeah. that you just did what you were told. And if you didn't, you know, I, I did it, you know, those days you used to have sort of sales brochures, yeah. which the reps, because the reps used to sell to the bookshops with them. Yeah. And I made the mistake of producing one that compared him to John Updike in some way. Okay. And he found out about it within, I think, 48 hours. and. We had to withdraw it and reprint it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. And again, you know, the great Philip Roth had, in my view, without any question, the worst book jackets of any major author of the last hundred years. Why? Because, because he, he always, you know, he chose them. He, he okay. employed Milton Glaser to do them. They were, as it were, he did not his publisher. He did. He did, and they were fifty years behind their time, as it were. Yeah. And, you know, when I started, I said, oh, well, you know, we can do much better than this, Mr. Roth. You know, no way. You just did what you were told. Okay. And and it was, after that, it was easy. Right. You know. Now that he's dead, will they be published differently? Well, they don't publish, yes, publish differently in paperback. Right. Okay. But the initial hardbacks will, will be in there. Well, look, we're, we're coming to the end of our time, but this was, this was really fascinating. Thank you for being such a, a gracious and candid guest and wishing you all the best with your, uh, your various projects. Thank you. So, Simon, I haven't had time, sadly, to listen to your conversation with Dan, but how did you find it? Uh, it was good. It was another wintry late afternoon in London, um, and there was uh, a bit of ambient noise in the office, which isn't, isn't fantastic. But, um, again, he's a... He's a a kind of legendary figure who people outside publishing don't know about. So he's famous as a, a sort of magical book doctor who's produced all these famous books, um, but obviously not a public name. And very interesting to talk to him. He's very self-effacing in a very English way, but clearly knew what he was about. So, uh, yeah, I felt a real privilege to talk to him. Um, anyway, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Aikham. Me, Eleanor Halls. Our producer is Nicola Keane. Zara Hankier does our social media. Our graphic design is by James Edgar. And our score is by Jessica Danheiser. You can find us on social media. We're at Always Take Notes on Facebook and Instagram. And Take Notes Always on Twitter. And we'd love it if you could rate and review the podcast on iTunes. And if you fancy chipping into our crowdfunding campaign, that's on patreon.com slash always take notes. Thank you. Thanks.